destroyed nonchalance. Taking the joy part one episode at a time. A social commentary podcast on pop culture, fashion, film, and music. This week we're taking our actor network theory. Hello. Hey. Welcome to Destroyed Nonchalance. This week we're going to be talking about Actor Network Theory. But first, let's catch up with how our weeks have been. Rick, tell me about your week. Well, we have been watching a few things. We did catch up on Queer Eye in Japan. Oh yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. We kind of broke it down over a few days. Uh, It is only... Four episodes, which are... It's quite short for their normal season, but you understand why, because they are in Japan, and the way that they do each episode, they don't... It's very seamless, because the Japanese people are speaking Japanese, and in real time, they seem to be understanding them and responding in English. Yeah, I didn't even notice that it was so seamless at first, but then you start to wonder, like, how is this happening? That's a lot of work. That's a lot of editing for somebody. Well, it is a lot of editing, because it turns out there's a translator. Like, that's mainly off-screen. And I was looking for earpieces, because... When they're reacting with emotional moments, I can't imagine them telling it, oh, let's, let's do it again. You know? Right. (laughs) So it makes it, when they're reacting to an emotional breakdown or a breakthrough that they have, are they just reading the pure emotion of it? Or is somebody feeding them something in a very small earpiece that I couldn't see because I guess in some of the some of the times I couldn't see their other ear or uh, so I wonder how they did that. It it would be interesting to find out the technical stuff in the background. Yeah, to watch a bit behind the scenes. But it what do you think about it? I well, I thought it translated pretty well, which is interesting because now this is the second American show that has moved to another country and taken on a different culture. We at first were seeing it with RuPaul Drag Race coming to the UK. Yeah. And, you know, you see this Americanism invading another land. And now you're seeing it with the five guys, Queer Eye, and they're taking it to a very different culture, um, Japan. So... Um, I'm kind of been curious about how their um, norms around being comfortable with yourself and how to present your sexuality and the kind of comfort level that you should expect to have, but we know is not very often the reality or sometimes not the reality, even in the States. How does that comfort level transfer to expectations within Japanese culture? Um, how do their expectations of the five guys um, of what should be allowed and, you know, the influence of rules and customs there. Like, what is the limit on those for people living in the Japanese culture? And there's not a lot of exploration of that. It, it kind of looks at it on an individual level where there's this, like, happiness and satisfaction that comes from having your appearance remade, your home remade, your relationship, you know, gets a spark because of what happened during the week that the five guys are with these guests. Um, but I think it would be interesting just because I think, one, the show is translated into English, almost a longitudinal look at what really happened when these people's lives were transformed through this, the week's proceedings. Um, how does it register? Does it, I mean, I would be curious about that. Yeah, no, I mean, I, it's never enough time, I guess, because if you're looking at all of that, then it might take more than an episode. So <laughs> yeah. they have to wrap up things and it's always a somewhat neat bow that they, that's true. They progress. And I, I think with, you know, it, each guy has their own section. They have food, style, the hair, each section. But when they went over there, they they crossed over a lot, I noticed, because some of the time Anthony would be having breakthroughs that you would expect Kurama to be pushing and having with these people, right. but they were happening while they were making a meal or confronting something with 
you know, yeah. after a, a, a yeah. fashion makeover. No, you know, that's a really good point, too. And, you know, it, maybe it's a matter of Karamo's, you know, use of cultural metaphors being really appropriate for American culture, whereas something like food and food preparation may be more universal, maybe more cross-cultural. Um, yeah, and I, I think it's it's interesting. I think it's interesting and important that things like these happen more right. often and they go to more countries because it gives people a picture of how we're all the same and these problems that they're having over there these people you've seen some of these problems in some of the episodes of that they've done in the US but right. people can relate to not having a good body image or you know holding yourself back from the things that you want because culture and society around you pushes that in. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about body issues and culture. I was surprised at the um, explicitness of that. Well, what was one of the expressions? You gave up on being a woman because of how you dressed and how yeah, that's just that's kind of harsh. accepted. And I think that gives this a very different idea of womanhood, you know, versus, you know, what you would see in America or what would be acceptable to say in America. Um, and again, that brings it back to, like, what kind of changes do these make? And, I mean, I don't know. <clears throat> yeah, it would be interesting to to have a follow-up episode or just to follow up something to see exactly how and if what they did actually changed anything because part of the time when I'm watching it it's it's good and it's interesting and it's following the track record the track that they put me on right but then I wonder well the person is responding exactly how you would expect them to respond so are they responding because they think they need to say that and there's no real change inside or because it's actually happening so or you is know, it more like a formula for television like on a product of editing yeah so and... part of it part of me wants to believe all of it and i think parts of it are real because i would yeah, think it'd be I mean... very hard to mess with all of it and get the things out then that come out right but you know some parts of us are I don't know the word. I think it's complex. And yeah. it's probably, you know, I mean, a simplification that happens through the format of the, the show itself. And I don't know, have you gone on like, social media to follow any of these, what the five guys call heroes of the episodes? I mean, no, I know I haven't. I don't have time I for that. But No, I haven't followed any of that. We just kind of watched the show. Yeah. <laughs> and that's where it ends. I mean, it always seems like whether or not you buy into the idea that these changes are sustainable, it's like it's it's not hard to glean inspirations from it. And yeah, I mean, some of it is trendy, which is you know better than a lot of television. A lot of it, you know, you get to see some kind of impact and some kind of like um, cultural resonance, which you don't always get to see in a lot of television shows. Um, so, I mean. It's probably a mixed bag, but for, you know, the show in and of itself, it works for me. I mean, it's fine. I'm not expecting, like, major transformations out of it, but it is like a jolt. It feels like um, a self-help caffeine shot by the time that I'm done with it. Yeah, and I think that it works really well for Netflix to be doing this in other countries because... They are everywhere. Yeah. So I want to see a Mexico version. I want to see them go to everywhere. I want to, them to come to the UK, go to France, go to South America. Just, you know. I want to see, that's, yeah, definitely. And I want to see something longitudinal. I want to see like a follow up, like, oh, we caught back up with these people and well, they kind of, you know, went back to their ways or no, this is the impact that they've had. I mean, they've opened this door to what's possible. You know, they've opened this curiosity. You know, I think there's some threads that could be followed up on. Yeah. What else so have you been watching? I watched this on my own, but I watched the American Horror Story Apocalypse. Ugh. 
And it's kind of something I watch while I'm doing posts for Image Amplified. Yeah. Side watch. And it's a Ryan Murphy show, which is hit or miss, or it can be hit That's and exactly miss. exactly why. So uh, we liked we, American. We love Horror American Story. Horror Story for, for the like first two or three seasons, yeah. and then um, it just really went sour, and it was really bad, and I've really incoherent, and um, it just you know it wasn't scary. <laughs> yeah, no so I, I saw the election one, and that was just a complete mess. Yeah, I saw really, it like last because year. we just saw one of Ryan Murphy's election shows, and it was actually really good, insightful yeah. about the. Um, yeah, no, I mean it, it's the American Horror Story dump yeah. <laughs> being thrown into it. This is completely different than the politician, and it was just. Um, so wait, there's the politician. Which we really liked is from yeah. Ryan Murphy, but then there's the American Horror Story take on election. Which <coughs> who were the main characters for this? I mean, it's always the same actors, and I don't want to talk too much about election. I want to talk about Apocalypse because there's some positive things that I saw okay. there. But election basically looks at the 2016 election yeah. and Trump and Hillary and the things that came out of that and right. came after that so what are it, some of the it things? tries to say something with the fact that the women's movement and ev the positives that trump and the trump effect had but it so it it starts with election night and all the liberals are freaking out and right it just it goes to like the distortion of his supporters and just getting away with murder straight up and so I take it it's then, not a it's not a well balanced no take no on. just be <laughs> built up and it's really really random because it it goes into the that woman that shot uh, Andy Warhol Valerie Solanas yeah yeah and it picks up on her having some type of like cult thing that has survived with her manifesto and has built up this Trump type thing. Is there thing. really such a thing? I, I don't know. I don't know. But I mean, it, she did have a manifesto. Yeah, and, and it could be that they actually looked at the real manifesto and and it was the organization that behind the scenes organization that built up this Trump movement so that it could have this positive effect, like kind of to to kill the patriarchy. So, right, so Trump is essentially like, okay, women are fed up and they're done and, you know, they're going to murder. <laughs> so it's actually like an intentional joke, almost like a Trojan horse kind of thing. Yeah, it tried to be, but it fell a oh, lot. Was it very it convincing? Just, it was just like a lot of like twists and turns and meme type crap that... That's what ruined memes. It was it was. That's bad. what ruined Ryan Murphy's, like, I mean, so much of what I've seen of his and what made me stop watching his his work is, like, the memification of yeah, plot like, and character and, and episodes. And, yeah, Glee was another world. It, was like, it, it lost coherence and that, for me, it lost impact. Yeah, and, I mean, with Apocalypse, it started a bit of a mess. Yeah. It started interesting, but it's just like, what's going on? So it started backwards. And as it gained in episodes, yeah. it started to connect the previous seasons of American Horror Story, the good ones. Right. Like Murder House, Coven, and ho a little bit of Hotel Cortez, but I didn't watch the Hotel one. But it started with putting people in a place where you know you don't know what the hell is going on and then it starts explaining as the episodes go through and it starts connecting and bringing back characters that you saw in Coven like the witches yeah and yeah. Fiona and this is when is Kathy Bates in it? yeah oh she's in it okay. and um the the main lady what's her name Jessica Ling Jessica comes Ling back. is Gaga in it? no no she comes back as the characters that she played in Murder House and Coven. So it's interesting to see to see that and to see some of that go in and be explained in certain ways. And right. some of the characters we really liked about Murder House were good. But anyhow. So when did um, Apocalypse, when was it made? It was last year and right now there's a new one. 
Oh, so there's a new season of Apocalypse. Air, no, there's a new season airing now, American Horror Story, and it's a teen camp or some camp, essentially like 80s slasher flick movie type. Oh, uh, okay. I don't know. So I, I should watch Apocalypse? One. If you can, if you can muster through four episodes that are really bad. <laughs> okay, well, if I know there's like some kind of redemption coming uh, along. Kind of barely, but there's like one really good episode and then everything kind of. Okay. Stumps along. Okay. Well, there's so much good television on right now that we'll see. Yeah, yeah. What's something else that you've been watching? We went to watch Last Christmas with oh, Emilia yeah, Clark Last and Christmas. Emma Thompson. Yeah. <laughs> and I I really liked knowing everywhere that they filmed. Oh my god, the location was all over like London and all of the hidden places that almost we know. Every scene in that movie was within walking distance our neighborhood. of our flat. <laughs> yeah. So, that was what did you think? Um, Stephanie Miller described it as a cross between Love Actually and Sixth Sense. Yeah, I mean it has a twist. <laughs> okay. Which is yeah, I mean that's a good description. <laughs> Stephanie Miller had it right. I, I mean I. It's one of those like fluffy Christmas movies which I enjoyed. I mean, but I the twist kind of makes it. Um, it takes out the fluff in it. It makes it kind of gritty, doesn't it? I mean, yeah. I don't want to give away the ending, and this we didn't announce this is going to be like a spoiler free, but um, and I mean, it just came out for us. The Christmas season is barely even here. I mean, we're not British, so we're not exactly putting out our Christmas trees right now. But, Although I want to, just might as well because everything is decorations are going up. But yeah, I know we have we like, still have Thanksgiving. That the, that imaginary threshold. <laughs> So maybe we'll talk about a uh, a full discussion of what is it called? Last Christmas? Yeah. Closer to Christmas. Maybe we'll do like a um a Christmas movie right countdown or something. No, that Who could knows? be interesting because there's a bunch of other Netflix those types of movies and um, Lifetime I know Light. I'm, I'm going like long, but I've been. The, the new Pokemon Sword and Shield games came out, and I've oh, been yeah. playing Pokemon Shield, and... I've been, I'm I've been playing Pokemon Sword, and I have to say, like, I'm not the biggest Pokemon Pokemon fan um, player. Like, I don't really like Pokemon Go, but I do like this. We're playing it on Switch, and for me, it's more involved, and I can play it for 15 minutes when I need a break here or there. So what do you think of the game so well, far? Well, games are supposed to be good... Like I only play two games, the 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 Pokemon games, and not all of them. Just the the main the main console ones, like 3DS and the Pokemon Go, and then Zelda. That's pretty much it. Yeah, you're not really much of a gamer. No, but I'm I'm loving the the Shield game. I'm not that far ahead. It's it's a little more difficult because I'm getting to areas where I'm getting beat down. <laughs> So I need to but train it's up. set in the British culture. Yes, I mean, a lot of it looks like the, London, Edinburgh. Yeah, it's um, the Galar Some of it looks like region. Dover. Um, so, that's one of the things that I like about it. And I don't know enough about the games to know the differences between Shield and Sword or whatever those are. No. But I know that there's some Pokemon that are exclusive to my games. Yeah, that's that the main difference. The exclusive Pokemon. I mean, it, with previous titles, like, they base... They base the region on, you know, like Hawaii was the last region with Alola. Yeah. And they've had regions of based in New York or, of course, Tokyo. So who was your buddy Pokemon through this? Sable. Sable. Sable is and the what's one Sable I had to like? choose because he's, he's like a sad frog-like Pokemon that is just... Like a blue looks, tadpole. Yeah, and he looks like he needs a hug all the time, <laughs> and I need to take care of it. What my I did the white and orange bunny, I can't remember the name Score of bunny. it. Scorbunny. Scorbunny. He's a bit anxious, a little bit, like, manic. I kind of like that. He's fast. He's and, like Adderall ridden. <laughs> yeah, it's like, he's not too needy. And, and like, I don't, yeah, so that's who I chose. He's your personality for sure. Well, so it's been interesting to play it. Yeah, I'm enjoying it. I'm liking it. I haven't gotten. I don't think I'm as far along as you are, but you know, it's it's fun, I, and I like. Yeah, I like the um, 
the architecture and the countryside and everything. Yeah, like, like all the London stuff and the architecture is just amazing. And it's really cool to see all the small things, like things from the tube or the phone boxes or even the countryside. Oh, I haven't seen any of the phone sign. boxes yet. Is it because I'm not in the new the city? I don't, it could be or... I don't know, but I think like the small villages and stuff, that's where we start and just the the sheep and the hedges and everything is just very like English yeah, countryside I mean, or the metropolitan the British. you know the Brits who are playing this game is going to be very familiar but even you know visitors who've ever taken a train through the countryside you see so much sheep so many grassy yeah. hills and all of that kind of stuff it's like I mean it's pretty and it's, it's very you know it, it fits it works really yeah. well I think yeah, so those are the main things. We're, we're also following the impeachment hearings with Stephanie Miller, Rachel Maddow, and The View. And it's yeah, insane. Stephanie Miller, <laughs> Rachel Maddow, and The View. The View gives us like a conversational surface level discussion. And then Rachel Maddow, she goes into detail, yeah. like making all the connections for us so that we can understand it in depth. And then Stephanie Miller kind of helps us laugh about it. And yeah, definitely. I think you need that kind of a mix because, yeah, it's so much. It's such a complicated subject. And, um, this, you know, there are many people who haven't lived through an impeachment of a president before and it's like entirely new. So it's, it's really helpful to have some familiar voices that are kind of guiding you through going through it with you. Yeah. And the different views, I think, help because sometimes something that we hear on the view is not as they don't have enough time first of all that's one of the frustrating things about the yeah. view i mean it could be a, a two hour long political show and i'd be happy with it yeah they just don't have enough time so they it's very surface level and some of the Im important things that they touch on don't really reflect in something like it's a different take which is good to understand and and here but then stephanie miller has her take where something the same thing can be covered in a completely different eyeglass and their take on it is different and then you have rachel maddow which and she's kind of crossed into she's been on the view before and she's also been on stephanie miller before yeah yeah so rachel maddow and she's also been on pod save america um i really liked her interview there that that might be another one that we could listen to to get a different understanding yeah. um it's some of the obama people so um an insider perspective of what's going on but i mean even just that alone it's kind of a lot <laughs> It's a lot, and time. I'm telling you, um, as I'm, you know, I spend a lot of time looking at screens and um, making notes because I'm doing my research all the time, and, and I'll have to put them... your week. So yeah, I mean that's my that, week. Right? Um, I, you know, I'm reading about emotional capitalism and um, emotion as a kind of capitalism, but and I'm going through this, but then um, I have to just put my devices on do not disturb so that the headlines don't come in because uh, there's in one sense you know i think the impeachment hearings are very important and it's bringing to light a lot of um really problematic stuff that we didn't really we suspected was going on but we suspect it was going on but i don't think that we knew to the extent to which it was happening and for me it's Creating an emotional reaction, um, it's very tense and, um, it's hard for me to experience this as any kind of a celebration because for, for an American president to have done the things that he's being accused of doing, it's not a bright day. It's not a time for balloons and confetti. And that's when a headline comes in like that, it doesn't, it doesn't feel like a celebration. No, it and feels it like a, like a bracing, like, hold on, because, I mean, yes, you want justice to be served, it's very important, but these are people who've been elected to government by people who believed in them enough to elect them, and these are people who have been given power, who have, who've caused all kinds of damage that we're only beginning to assess, and how do we get out of this? I mean, what's going to happen to America, its citizenry, as we move past this? I mean, it's really disturbing. And every time one of the headlines comes in, I mean, it's like 
Can I focus on my research? Can I put my head down and just concentrate on what I need to? And how responsible or irresponsible is it to ignore it? I mean, because you never know what the next headline is going to say. You just don't know. I mean, it for a time, the shootings felt like that because there was a period where you, we were literally getting a headline about mass shootings um, every two days. And you were just wondering where it was happening, you know, who was being affected from one day to the next. But at this point, it's like, okay, now we're talking about the head of our government and how that's being affected and what new twist and turn is going to play out. And it's, it's really tough. I mean, I'm experiencing it as a toughness to get through what I really need to get through because I, it's making me question with the understand, like my understanding of responsible. Yes, I need to get through my research program, but I also need to, I need to understand what's happening with our government. So it's been a really tricky balance for me. How is that for you when you're going through this? I don't mean to rant. I'm just trying to describe what it's like. This has been my week. Research, impeachment, and then mind-numbing, like 15 minutes here, 30 minutes there while we eat, watch a show, and then going back to research and impeachment. No, I mean, I'm... I agree with what you're saying, and part of it is that we've known for a long time how corrupt this president has been and how illegitimate he is. And some of these things actually coming out now into the light and people actually corroborating and having these hearings, it's really good to hear them and... I hope that there is some justice and for all the people around him, you know, you have Roger Stone getting guilty verdicts and his lawyers and a bunch of the people in the potential for Giuliani to be indicted. Yeah. They're all getting behind bars and everybody's like jump off the boat. But I agree that all these headlines, it's like a sense sense sensationalizing sensationalizing of this and that's why I like listening to Stephanie Miller Rachel Maddow and The View because it's it's there for you it's not like a headline that wants a click it's like yeah. come come cuz it's it's an, it seems to me like and I hate saying the media because it just generalizes every everybody in the media but I mean in these three they're trying to make to money our media. right yeah there, it, it seems like every time there's a headline, oh, opportunity, get a, you know, get a article written so that it shoots up to everybody and like, and they have this. Right. To click on. And it's, I, I want it a little bit more measured. I want to go through Stephanie Miller and what they have to say about the articles so that are being So do you block the news alerts that come in? No, they come in. But you just kind of I ignore just them. Don't, yeah, I don't look at the articles and I don't, cause I mean, <laughs> there is a point where you have to slow down everything that you can take in because you just can't. And there is a point where everybody's saying the same thing. Yeah. Or, you know, well, at least this, the, one if you're on one on side, thing. yeah, if you're on one side, you hear, you start to hear repetition and on the other side, you start to hear their, ver- their version of a repetition. And then, and I can hear that on Stephanie Miller. I mean, it's not like she just plays the liberal side. I mean, what's the, t- her tagline is too liberal for conservatives and too politically incorrect for liberals. So she's in, she's in the middle <laughs> of all of this. And I just, I like the the comedy side of things that she right. takes. She has to do the fart jokes. She, you, you need like a break a little bit, fun stack. And just, it's kind of like, I don't know. I don't know. It's just, I don't want to say like the, being in the foxhole with right. those people and waiting, weighing through like everything that's happening, but. That's how it feels like sometimes when things just keep coming out, especially in the last week where these hearings have started and 
things are coming out publicly and I mean every week before that things were just leading up to this and things coming out and so I yeah. mean it is serious I'm happy that it's happening and I hope that there is some justice and everything in the end yeah and he gets kicked out have you asked any of your American friends what it's like over there I mean because we're over here we're a bit removed from it I mean I think that uh, most people here are familiar with what's going on well, we're but having it's an not, election here too. it's not like living in the middle of it and no. I haven't really I, I mean there's no way I would ask my family because the the subject of politics is so divisive in that se- in that sense because we have like you know conservative very conservative, very liberal, like side by side, and that's like throwing, um, you know, a match into dr- like firewood, and it's just going to explode. So, but um, I haven't really. I mean, I wonder what it's like to go to work, and you know, everybody there. I is, don't know. I mean, we don't have a lot of American people to ask. We have never really thought to ask. Yeah, maybe we should ask. I, I'm like for our friends in Baltimore. I don't know. It might just not be something that they look at as much as we're looking at it. I, I think you'd have to make a conscious effort not to look at it. Yeah, and then but you're kind of you like, can be aware of it with a headline here and there, but not look at it as we're listening to two hours of Stephanie Miller and an hour of Rachel Maddow and 20 minutes of The View. That's a deeper look, I think, that most Americans bother with. For me, it... It's a way of digesting it, though. Having, you know, watching uh, The View and listening to those two podcasts, it helps me digest it and yeah. make sense of it. Because just left on my own, it'd be pretty overwhelming. Yeah, they definitely help. So <laughs> it's good that we have those. And it's a bit of a mess, everything that's happening. But anyways. Yeah. So um, my week... Again, just to cap that off, it's been research, um, looking at ontology, ontological design, um, critical design, and um, today I've been reading a lot on the critique of ethical ontology, which is trying to blend ethics with ontology, and um, some of the oversimplification that happens when you try to blend and ontology is basically um how things are how things exist and um you know ethics is like the morality basically um anyway it's complicated um and but i'm i'm deep into that but speaking of complicated and deep this second section session we're going to be talking about actor network theory which is um you know, my project makes use of that. It sounds really complicated, um, but really, um, it allows for a complexity, a complex description that tries to break free from assumptions that other theories try to build into their na- analysis. Um, but we can go more into that when we start the second session. Okay, so now we're back and we're talking about actor network theory. And I've been looking at actor network theory for um, a couple of years. And you, Rick, have been looking at actor network theory for... A few days. A few days. Mm, barely. <laughs> it's just bad. Okay, so, I mean, just straight up, this is not um, the most... I, I mean, it's common sense in a way, and it's it gets to be clear after you understand the idea behind it. But when you really narrow it down and break it down, and even then, <laughs> give me your impressions of it so far. Give me like the general points of it so I don't, far. I mean, I have I I have a few points, and as I was going down and writing these different points, I would get to the end of a page and just no, none of it, <laughs> go away, and then just. I did that like three times, so I I don't know. I have a few things that might not make sense if I'm going through each of them. I tried to rearrange it so that it could potentially okay. flow somewhat, but it's all right. It might be very difficult. One one thing, it's definitely not for 
<laughs> it's it's breaking my nonchalance, destroying it. Just I think, I think this just looking at actor net network theory at all. I don't think that people generally would, just regular everyday people. But they don't realize that they have, um, because there are lots of, I mean, media. Uh, newscasts, for example, use action network theory. It's very common in the media. And, um, what we listen to with Rachel Maddow is. You live it. Yeah. You live it. You you have networks in, in everything that you do. You can do, you can say anything is a network and really analyze it and kind of. I would drop start out with this. Get lost in it. I know I asked you to like give your main points, but let me just put this overriding theme. I put the top first, and I would say that just an everyday phrasing of what active network theory means to me is that everything is a network. And anything that you think of is a network of networks. So then it's like, okay, how do you identify what makes up a network? And that's basically what you're trying to do through an investigation using active network theory. So now, everything being a network, and everything is a network, let's start going through your main points. And just start at the top, and we yeah, can make sense of it as you go. I'll start at the top, and we'll see what happens. Right. So, just starting up... So, it's incredibly difficult to define. Um, I think there were three main people right. that have developed this. One of them is Latour, and none of them agree, or... You know, they yeah, just, no, there's some debate. About they don't agree in any, some of it and none of it. So it's hard to define. And after just reading and reading, I, I don't, I'm not sure that I have a full grasp on it and understand it. So it'll be good when I hear your side of it, but I'll have some questions. Basically, okay. it seems that the name is misleading. Okay. So Latour be, has, you know, yeah. even debated himself, like made, he's debated earlier points of his about how good of a name it is. Yeah, because the, the words in actor network theory kind of don't fit what the, the meaning is and right. have, make you think of something else. Like theory, for example, um, it's not really a theory. Latour no. says it, it puts it, he, he says it's rather a method on how to, or a how to book. Yeah. So I um, mean, like, why, why, why call it a theory, anyways? Because I think the thinking on it evolved over time. Yeah. But for me, I mean, to address what you've just said, it is a methodology where it's rather than asking how, I mean, rather than asking why something happens, you're describing. How it happened. Yeah. So you're describing rather than explaining. And Latour said, um, one of his quotes is about the only explanation needed is the description. So for me, I mean, that's how I'm using actor network theory. It's a description of how something happens. Okay. Yeah. And network implies that what is described takes the shape of a network, which is not necessarily the case. Right. So I feel like. A lot of the topics that we've looked at and I've looked at for the first time kind of lead, lead up to this. Right. Everything kind of leads up to this. So some of the points I made is we act on things and things act on us. Right. So a way to understand our relationship with technology. So, yeah, a, a way to understand our relationship with technology and technology's relationship with us. Right. So humans... And tech are equal actors here. Well, that's... Let me respond to this part. Actors can be human and non-human. And that's mm -hmm. one of the controversies around certain actor network theory uh, perspectives. So, um, it is... It's all about the relational ties between actors. And the actors might be human, non-human. It might be um, technology... Which, um, uh, or it might be something else, um, but it originated, actual network theory originated with studying science and technology. So it sounds very technical, and that's because it kind of originated with, like, a very technical field. But then sociology saw that, oh, this could be really useful. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it is all about relational ties. Yeah, and so, I mean, it's, I see billions of networks everywhere. 
And it's interesting to explore the social aspect of tech. Some things, for example, could not exist without the other. Like right. you have Facebook that exists because social bonds make it exist. And social bonds are affected for good or bad because Facebook is, exists. Right. So both sides have similar impacts on each other. Right. And let me respond to that. Yeah. Um, there are billions of networks everywhere because basically anything that you want to study, that very act of wanting to study it creates a network. So you could say, I want to look at people who only hang red curtains. Okay. Or you could say, you know, I want to see, um, you know, you form a community. So for my project, it's around fashion branding, a particular brand, and um, it's, a th it's aesthetic. So basically, anytime you frame something to study it, you've created um, a network out of it. Yeah. It, but it's the... It gets the impulse for a network because then you have to go in and start describing all of the actors in the roles that constitute but that. But you also have to know when to stop. <laughs> exactly. Because that's one of the things I ran into that you could just go on forever down to uh, atoms. Yeah, essentially. Yeah, and so um, that's... I think that responding to that... There's a social side to agreeing what the network is. So, um, the actors within the network have to agree on the description of the network. So, if you start going beyond what the actors themselves see as essential to the network, you've, you've gone too far. Um, and in fact, to that point, networks work because th some things get packaged up and you don't think about them in terms of their smaller parts. For example, when you say iPhone, yes, there's a camera to it, but there are atoms. But you don't think about the atoms when you think about a, an iPhone. You don't think about the circuitry. Um, you may not even yeah. think about the lock screen after a while because it all comes together, it's punctualized into an object that you don't think about anymore. Only when it breaks down do you start realizing that the iPhone is glass, it's circuitry, or your software experience is And that it's an important actor why in <laughs> exactly. existing in this world that we're in now. So punctualization and reification kind of help you from going too far down the rabbit hole and to molecules. Because really, I mean, if you're going to get a consensus around objects, then it would be like, okay, I, I don't have to go to the level of molecules because they're all just referring to the cameras on their iPhones. Or, you know, um, cotton or polyester fabric in a red curtain. They don't have to understand, you know, the chemical makeup of the red dye. Yeah, I mean, I... I see the argument, but I don't know that I would go that deep if you're actually analyzing. No, it's and it's more like a trying to stay above head and not dive in so much that you get lost. Right. After a while, I mean, you can you can lose the forest for the trees if you look too close at the bark. I mean, the bark is there, the roots are yeah. there, the water's there, but are you really paying attention to the forest, or did you get lost at looking at the bark? So. And that's kind of like an orientation. Um, what's another point that you have? So, as I read, trying to wade through the info, and tell me if I'm wrong, <laughs> because and I may not this know. example that I'm, I might just you know go off because I kind of started this and I went off and right. did something else and then came back to it, but I could be just completely looking at this wrong. Okay. So, actor network theory can be used to analyze and dissect anything. An event, or a process, or an activity. So, for a basic example, and again, stop me if I'm wrong, today I decided to play the new Pokemon game. Looking at this through actor network theory, I'm an actor, the game is an actor, mm -hmm. Nintendo is an actor, mm -hmm. the Nintendo Switch is an actor, Right. and... Then you could look at the Pokemon photo I saw on Facebook was an actor that reminded me to go play the game. 
or right. that kind of led me that or the physical pokeball that i have that i put a pokemon in and it cried to me and it reminded me oh you put a pokemon in this pokeball that's an actor that kind of it it affected me to go play yeah the it, game and it you it, engaged with it and it brought you into the network of- yeah so it just it, it affected me in th- deciding to play and continuing to play and as i continue to play i changed the internal progression of the game so so you mediated yeah yes. so you I had mean, an impact exactly it had an impact on me and the different actors and i mean you can look at a lot of a lot more actors i don't know how how i would look at it and where i would need to stop because i don't i would need somebody who's been in this action network theory field yeah, to I mean, guide a little to it's kind of like using a spiritual guide or something like that to if if you're going in saying okay well this could be an actor but do you really want it to be an actor in this how important is it or yeah I, I mean know. if it made itself known in the process of you playing this game and I mean I mean it's it's a mediator yeah it made itself known. So, I mean, you could even take it as far as Sabo and, you know, seeing Sabo or a Nintendo advertisement yeah, you know, like on Facebook prompted you to play. So that was like your link into it. Somehow you engage with, and I mean, the advertisement is not accidentally a part of the network. It's supposed to be a lure into the network of you playing. Yeah. And it, rem- it reminds me of, um, cause it is. It is kind of like the mindset that you surround yourself in for a time. Right. So, for example, I can go through cycles where something seems really important and and overtaking on, like, you know, whether it's a show or a game or, or cards or whatever it is. As you're growing up, there's phases where something is just like... It is the most important thing in the world at that time right. for whatever it is you're doing. And, and that's affected by what you decide to bring in the actors that come in that kind of take over your life. And that's and like, you know, when Buffy was airing, that was like, OK, the Buffy is like the most important thing. And it kind of overtook me and I was buying magazines and cutting. But up that's I and think making. Yeah. To that point, before we move on too far, that process of negotiation happens through, for actors. So you brought to that relationship a negotiation saying, I'm willing to spend this amount of money. I want this in return. I'm willing to spend this amount of time. I'm going to get this in return. I mean, I don't, it's not always so conscious as that, but you are negotiating with every action, your involvement. So you come to it with an agency. And that's one of the complications. Yeah, and it's not always just that, though. It's it's also the social aspect of it, because... Right. Buffy was brought to me by a friend, somebody in my social circle, and so that, the the Buffy, the Charmed, the, all of those things, the shows like the Marilyn Manson and all of that, like, initially, all of that, that social, that network, it was brought to me by people. So it's part of a, a bigger network. Yeah, exactly. And, and then I went into that network and then the decisions started. And, you know, the one time I was cutting up a magazine and it's like, why are you cutting it up? Just save the whole page or like, you know, just, and I saved magazines for like three years. (laughs) So then I kind of stopped that, but. Was that like a record of your interest or like a. No, I mean, I, I would scrapbook. Yeah. And I would cut up like, oh, I see Sarah Michelle Geller somewhere or I see a charmed something and I would put it in my scrapbook and then eventually they became too precious to cut. So I would keep them in covered plastic and I have a few somewhere, but, you know, I became the it, protecting them, like protecting Madonna magazines where she's in the cover. And all of that was because of these networks that did that and then i started doing that so they affected me 
to the point where I was doing those things and I, I'm out of it now, but again, it's like the social aspects and the technology and what's happening. Like Buffy's not on anymore. So it's not something that's like, Oh, I gotta go and you know, it kind of got diffused. To. Yeah. It gets diffused and then another light comes in, another piece of technology comes in, you know, whatever it is, you're, but, you go into it, but it also goes into you. <laughs> no, no, I mean, that makes sense. And that goes, that's illustrating how network participation is performative. The, um, the constitution of a network is performative and it's always having to be reestablished and reestablished. And eventually it's like what you described your ties into that network fade and break to the point where it doesn't have a role in your daily life. If you were to describe your, your day, uh, through actor network theory, like Buffy may not play, like it may not be visible at all. And that's to say that Buffy doesn't exist somewhere. It's just talking about in relation to your life. There's or that it isn't that for somebody else now because it's always yeah, new exactly. for somebody else. Like Harry Potter or any of that. It's always, somebody's always coming into it as somebody's leaving. So it's just... Yeah. It's 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 an actor on itself. If you're just looking at like Harry Potter, that that's not a person. Well, you know... <laughs> But the, this phenomenon. So I see, I see why things can also be as important as people are because they affect people or social. It's things really just as much. I mean, it could be said that it's a myth that anything is just anything without being impacted by something else. And, I mean, the idea of autonomy is almost like a shortcut in thinking that kind of um, glosses over the complexity of how things really are. Well, yeah, because it just sounds like you're fooling yourself. And even if you think that way, that's, that's you're, you're in that complexity of thinking. Like, you're in that school. If you think that you're above it, then you're in, in it anyways in that section of exactly people thinking that they're above it so by having an opinion on it <laughs> and by acting an opinion on it you've performed yourself into a network around yeah. that i mean some networks it's a really difficult to avoid i mean if like politics for example or fashion <laughs> um politics or fashion you're if you don't if you dress and you think you're outside of fashion, you're still putting on clothing. You're just coming across as a certain type of fashion person, which is, you know, a pretty unconcerned fashion person. But you can't put on clothes without participating in fashion. And you can't be an, like, an American citizen without being impacted by politics. By the very fact of your citizenship, you are involved in that network. I mean, you can't be a human without participating in politics because you breathe. Yeah. And the air is affected by politics, whether you like it or not, or whether you decide to participate or not. Right. I think there are two <clears throat> really helpful, to bring this back to a couple of examples, there are two really helpful metaphors. Well, one helpful metaphor for me, and it's that expression, you're not stuck in traffic, you are the traffic. Meaning, you are constituting the traffic. And if you left and weren't a part of it, the traffic would be that much better. So you tend to think of problems as happening to you rather than your participation in a problem. But your participation in a problem makes it that much worse. And then another thing is the Instagram social network. And that, for me, really um, speaks to the perform performativity of a network. If you don't put a post onto Instagram, you are not part of the network. Um, if you don't make content that identifies you there, then um, if you're not engaging in any way, then you aren't there. You're not part of the network. Um, so you kind of don't exist? Within that network, you don't exist. But that's not to say that there's not parts of you, billions of other parts of you, reconfigured however you want to reconfigure them to say that you're not existing in those other places. It's just, you know, if you're not a Moschino fan, on a Moschino network on Instagram, 
if you never see any of the content, if you never post anything about it, you're not, you don't exist on the Moschino network. I don't understand why, because I've seen it be offensive to people. Like at school, like in my program, I think there was a conversation surrounding this. Yeah. This, you know, the the forest falls in the tree and does anybody hear it? If, you know, does it make a sound? Because people want to, don't want to be told that they don't exist, but they don't understand how simple it is to, it's just, it's, it's not an insult. It's just from the point of view of that network, which is just a framing <clears throat> of what you want to look at and study. I mean, <clears throat> that's just it. I mean, you may just may not be relevant to how somebody framed an activity or a common occurrence that they wanted to study. It may not be relevant. It's not to say that you don't exist. It's just you, you don't participate. You don't engage with that. You don't exist as that network because that network is made up of performing yourself into it. If you're not performing yourself into it, then you're not a part of it. So what's your easiest explanation, layman's term for actor network theory? Since you've been in it for so long, you understand it in ways that I can't. And I'm not saying I'm, I mean, somebody might give me some feedback. I'm, I wouldn't be surprised at all if I got something wrong or like I'm just seeing one side of a debate somewhere. That but being it's so said, left open, even debated by these three people that are like the authors of it. Yeah. I mean, some people say I think that it's, it's so open for that. To, it's. You know, Criticized because it doesn't have like a sense of morality to it, right? Um, well, how do you know what's right or wrong? Or, I mean, if you're just only trying to describe something, well, I mean, that's one of the criticisms. Like, where's the morality? How do you know the up and the down and the good and the bad? And it's like, no, it's not an explanation. It's a method for description. Now, you can ask an immoral <laughs> question and apply the tool to understanding your immoral question and get something evil out of it. Or, you know, you can ask a question around justice and be Rachel Maddow and apply it and get something that helps you to understand how criminal activity happened. It's how you want to use the tool. It's easier to criticize how you're using the tool rather than the tool itself, because really all you're getting down to is how this actor relates to this and how that other actor related to this actor. It's just a, it's a description of Well, yeah, it relations. sounds like the, the slippery slope argument, which I hate. Now, for my project, I am adding something to it, and that's narrative theory, so that I can get the story around these relations. But as a basis for describing the relationship... I mean, actor network theory is really good. I mean, it's a really solid way of investigating well, something it makes, like that. It makes a lot of sense to me to be looking at a network within Instagram, for example, and even deeper within Instagram, a network that is, exists around a hashtag or a brand. Right. Because that just makes... That that makes sense within actor network theory because if you're participating in that with a hashtag, however you do, then you're part of that network and it's easy to pick out the actors because the actors put right. themselves there. Yeah, and, and the it actors, could have something to do with the I fact mean, that it's a the brand and is not a person, but it's the biggest actor. It is, a, yeah, it is a, a big actor for that. Um, and again, it might be because it's a science and technology area, you know, Instagram. But I think even with biology, you know, we're sitting here having a conversation. It's like, well, I'm a network of organs. And you, you want to talk about like whether or not you exist within a network. I don't have your liver in me. I have my liver in me. And if you want to study me, then your liver is irrelevant. <laughs> like, that, I mean, it does not say that your liver doesn't exist, but, you know, I have a system of organs working for me, organs and tissues and what's known as my biology that, yes, draws on the ecology of the earth and the oxygen in the air. And, it's con and you know, even that's not autonomous, but for me to have like a description of my biology, that's the framing around the organs that I would call myself. And that's 
you know, how I identify my network. You know where I got a, an, um, where I, my first introduction to actor network theory? Agnes Rocamora. And yeah. you saw her at the critical fashion panel. And, um, she has a chapter in the book, Thinking Through Fashion. And, you know, fashion is like a much more approachable subject for me, much less intimidating. And, um, I knew that chapter was there. I ignored it for my master's course. Yeah. Um, but for this, like looking into it, Agnes Rocamora, she did a really good job of presenting actor network theory to me in a way that wasn't intimidating. So anyone who has like an interest in fashion or um, kind of a good breakdown of how actor network theory can be applied to something like fashion, look for thinking through fashion because it's a really, I mean, it's a good breakdown. Well, I think it. those are the the best way to explain something is to put it into a, a context of fashion or I mean any anything. something relatable something relatable because yeah. it, it if you stick to the jargon to explain it and yeah, I know the jargon I'm the learning jargon. the jargon and but for this it's not helpful I don't think yeah I mean not for somebody who's not familiar with it and some I I find these topics they're breaking my I mean destroying my nonchalance on just these subjects and it's really interesting to look at and find out what these things mean and not be intimidated. So you've been finding some of the topics in the podcast, like just kind of shaking up your thinking a bit. They, they are something that you kind of live and breathe every day. You just don't have yeah. the name for. Yeah. And I think that, people if people have had the name for it they would appreciate it more if they understood that they already do it right and this sophisticated word or jargon that they don't understand that's intimidating it's it's not as intimidating and it shouldn't make you feel smaller like right. it might and i think that's one of the problems that we have with society now where you know, the lower classes don't think that somebody well-educated, it's kind of like looked down on now. And it's yeah, intimidating, but it shouldn't be because it's things that you kind of know, but you, right. you don't know how to put the title to it. Right. You know, and it's not just... um like a lower class kind of resentment over knowledge. But it's also, there's so many expertises out there that even if you're really well educated, you may not know some of this. I mean, it's just, there's so much to know. But yeah, I think that understanding actor network theory is, it's like one of those things when you realize your involvement in things and involvement in systems. And, and it can help you understand your involvement in, in everything. It can make you understand your involvement in politics because you are, whether you like it or not. Yeah. And you look at the network and you analyze it in that way and how it works. No, no, it's true. I mean, you start realizing, for me, it helped me start realizing choices that almost got packaged up and bundled that I just thought went together. And that's punctualization just the assumption that it goes together and that's the way it always has to be but it can be broken down into parts and components because sometimes it needs to be yeah. that breaking down of a network is sometimes a really good thing to happen Rick, are you ready to move on from actor network theory? yeah alright, well thanks for listening thanks for exploding, Rick for the conversation until next time bye, bye. bye. thank you for listening, we hope you enjoyed it Make sure you subscribe to our podcast, we put it on Google, and follow us on social media, we're on every platform, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, we're everywhere.